Welcome back YouTubers, this is what's the science behind that. And in today's video, I thought I'd go over the whole flat earth versus round earth debate. <clears throat> At first I wasn't really sure if I really wanted to do it, but finally I said, why not? <clears throat> okay, here's a list of reasons why the earth is actually round and not flat. Number one, the moon. Now that humanity knows quite positively that the moon is not a piece of cheese or a playful god. The phenomena that accompany it from its monthly cycles and lunar eclipses are well documented. It was a quite a mystery to the ancient Greeks though. In their quest for knowledge, they came up with a few insightful observations that helped us figure out the shape of our planet. Ah <clears throat> uh, yes, Aristotle. Aristotle, who made quite a lot of observations about the spherical nature of the Earth. He noticed that during a lunar eclipse, when the Earth's orbit is placed directly between the Sun and the Moon, creating a shadow in the process. The shadow on the Moon is... round. This shadow is the Earth's, and it's a great clue to the spherical shape of the Earth. Since the Earth is rotating... Uh, okay, I'd advise you to see the Falco Pendulum Experiment for a definite proof. Number two. Ships in the horizon. If you've been next to a port lately, or just strolled down a beach and stared off into the horizon, you might have, perhaps, noticed a very interesting phenomenon. Approaching ships don't just appear out of the horizon, like they should if the world was flat, but rather, they emerge from beneath the sea. <clears throat> the reason ships appear as if they emerge from the waves is because the world is not flat, it's round, okay? Here's a very interesting fun fact. Do you remember that story about Christopher Columbus sailing the ocean blue in 1492 in order to prove the world was round and not flat? What if I told you that story is completely false? Yep, surprisingly it is. <laughs> this flat earth myth made it to number one on the list of false historical myths as acknowledged by the Historical Society of Britain. In fact, with the exception of few French believers of both the church and the secular world, just about everybody in the day of Christopher Columbus knew the earth was a sphere. <clears throat> in fact, the Bible states in Isaiah chapter 40 verse 22, it states the earth is actually round. I'll explain more on this later. So where, then, did the story of Christopher Columbus and the Flat Earth originate from? Hmm. Well, actually, believe it or not, it originated from anti-creationists and atheists, whom are trying to attribute to the story to Christians and creationists in order to slander them and make them look bad. <sighs> yep, it was all created by the atheists. <clears throat> this is all well documented in the historian's uh, whose name is Jeffrey Burton Russell's book, which is titled Inventing the Flat Earth. Russell summed up his book in the scathing commentary at the American Scientific Affiliation Conference, also the ASAC. <clears throat> A reason for promoting both the lie about Columbus and the general lie that religion and science are in an eternal conflict in Western society is to defend Darwinism. That's right. The flat earth lie is, was basically like ammunition against the creationists. The argument was simply, uh, it was simple and powerful, if not elegant. Uh, this is a quote by an, uh, by an atheist. He quotes this. Uh, I believe it was during the conference as well. He says, look how stupid these creationists are. They are always getting in the way of science and progress. These people who... Uh, deny evolution today are exactly the same sort of people as those idiots who've at least a thousand years ago denied the round earth. Well, first of all, let me just uh, start with this. There are a lot of pretty good creationists today that actually know some pretty good scientific information. <clears throat> a lot of them uh, have actually helped us a lot. Like, um, 
drugs and antibiotic, for example, or maybe some of them have, has helped us out with astronomy or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I do want to point out that there are some evolutionists out there that are actually pretty stupid, believe it or not. So yeah, it can be vice versa. Even though you may, even if it doesn't appear to be, it can be. Uh, <clears throat> okay, first of all, Mr. Atheist, how stupid can you get? Come back to me once you've learned real science and then we'll talk about it. Don't just assume someone's an idiot without actually looking at their background first. Um, let alone, is what do you believe about that person even true? How do you know that what we uh, told you about that guy isn't a lie? Um, if you've ever watched some of my videos, you'd probably know by now that I am a creationist. And you're just lucky that at least I know what science is. And I actually know more, uh, some pretty good information about science in our world. A whole lot more than probably you, Mr. Atheist, believe it or not. But let's just uh, say that's a subject for later. And we can debate about that later. <clears throat> okay, so... Basically, this story was first propagated in 1830 by two anti-church authors, Anatole Jean Letron and Washington Irving. Now, whoa, 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 wait a minute. 1830? Yep, surprisingly. So you mean to tell me that this light has been uh, propagating around for nearly 180 plus years? And still... Even today, the atheists and anti-creationists are taking this lie, and they are concocted. Uh, they are taking that lie, which they created, and they are hurling it at creationists and Christians, which, by the way, has nothing to do with this lie. And they're trying to make us look bad. Uh, not cool, man, just not cool. So, right here... I believe the flat earth theory has just been debunked. Well, sort of. But actually, I want to keep on going even further into this subject. Because I believe there's a whole lot more to talk about than, well, what I just said. <clears throat> and number three, a very interesting one. Varying star constellations. This observation was originally made by Aristotle, who lived 384 to 322 BC. Aristotle declared the Earth was round, judging from the different constellations one sees while moving away from the equator. After returning from a trip to Egypt, Aristotle noticed that, quoting, there are stars seen in Egypt and Cyprus which are not seen in the northerly regions, end quote. This phenomenon can only be explained if humans were viewing the stars from a round surface. <clears throat> Aristotle continued and claimed that the sphere of the Earth is, quoting again, of no great size, for otherwise the effect of so slight a chance of a place would not be quickly apparent, end quote. And this is apparently from Decelio 29-A2-10. But anyways, the farther you go from the equator, the farther the known constellations go towards the horizon and is replaced by different stars. This would not have happened if the world was flat. Coming down at number four, shadows and sticks. If you stuck a stick in the mud, it will produce a shadow. The shadow moves as time passes, which is the principle for ancient clock shadows. I'm sorry, for ancient shadow clocks. If the world had been flat, then two sticks in different locations would produce the same shadow. Imagine the sun's rays hitting these two sticks some distance apart. If the Earth was flat, the resulting shadow would be the same length, no matter how far apart you place them. But they don't, because the Earth is round, not flat. This is because the Earth is round, like I just said. The sticks placed at different locations uh, will throw shadows of different lengths. <clears throat> okay, we have 
Aristothens, who lived 276 to 194 BC, used this exact principle to calculate the circumference of the Earth, and quite accurately too. For more information, please look up the demonstration video on YouTube titled, The Earth's Curvature is Tasty. Just look for a picture of an orange. Um, coming down at number five, this was a very far-fetched one, but I believe I can pull this one off. Number five is basically high distances, airplanes, and Earth's curvature. It's far-fetched, I know, but I believe I can pull it off. Standing in a flat plateau, if you look ahead of you towards the horizon, uh, you strain your eyes, and with the help of binocular lenses, you can see. Then you climb up the closest tree, the higher the better. Just be careful not to drop those binoculars and break their lenses. You then look again, strain your eyes some more, stare through the binoculars out into the horizon. The higher up you are, the farther you see. Usually, we tend to relate this to earthly obstacles, like the fact we have houses and other trees obstructing our vision on the ground. In climbing upwards, we have a clear view, but that's not the true reason. Even if you would have a completely clear plateau with no obstacles between you and the horizon, you would see much farther uh, from greater height than you would on the ground. This phenomenon is caused by the curvature of the Earth as well. This wouldn't happen if the Earth was flat. I have seen a lot of videos on this, but just allow me to explain first before you go ahead. Uh, we're going to get into planes now. If you've ever taken a trip out of the country, specifically long distance uh, destination trips, you could notice two interesting facts about airplanes in the earth. Fact number one, planes can travel uh, somewhat in a relatively straight line. A very long time and, surprisingly, will not fall off the edge of the earth. They can also circle the earth without stopping. Fact number two, if you look out the window on a transatlantic flight, or any other flight, you can, most of the time, see the curvature of the earth in the horizon. Um, I don't know how true that is, but yeah. I'd recommend doing your own research and just come to your own conclusions on that. Okay, so, Earth's curvature. I've seen some people say that Earth doesn't have a curvature. Well, if you simply just Googled it, or even performed the experiment yourself, you would probably know Earth does indeed have a curvature. Although, even though it doesn't look like it, it does indeed have one. The Earth has a radius of approximately 3,965 miles. Using the Pythagorean theorem, that of which calculates the Earth to an average curvature of 7.98 inches uh, per mile, or that's approximately 8 inches per mile squared. <clears throat> okay, I just want to uh, review some of the questions that some of you had about uh, regarding the whole airplane thing. Uh, the question number one, does an airplane need to constantly adjust nose down to follow the curvature of the Earth? The answer is yes. Allow me to explain first. A plane will follow at a constant altitude and will follow the curvature of the Earth and would not gain altitude during a level flight. For instance, if a plane is clear to maintain 35,000 feet by regulations, the pilot must maintain that level based on a standard barometric pressure setting. That's 29.92 INHG or 103 millibars. Hence, it would stay at the same altitude, that's FL-350, because the pilot is either controlling the plane manually or has engaged the autopilot to achieve that. There are two basic instructions that enable this procedure. One, the, end, uh, the altimeter, and two, the vertical speed indicator, that's, that's definition for VSI. The VSI provides short-term changes in pressure and indicates whether the plane is climbing or descending. These changes will give an indication to the pilot so that he would level the plane to maintain 35,000 feet. He will then adjust the controls very slightly by use of the elevator and trims. 
This can be performed automatically by the autopilot as well. As such, the flight controls are constantly moving and very subtle to maintain the correct altitude. In reality, a constant altitude must be kept using the standard pressure, and that means a fixed distance to the Earth's, quoting, the center of gravity, end quote, which is maintained, making the path of the plane a curved one. So the plane isn't really flying in a straight line, geometrically speaking. Uh, because the Earth uh, because the Earth has curved space around itself due to mass, it bends the very concept of straight line into a circle around itself. Now, ignoring the, second ch uh, the, the secondary changes such as, uh, for example, the weight of the plane or the atmospheric pressure, etc., etc., it has to adjust the control to maintain a specific amount. The flat Earth is uh, most likely will confuse themselves so much that they talk about descending millions and millions and millions of feet per, mi per minute, which, by the way, is completely false, um, and are just completely and utterly confused about how gravity works. So, my opinion, yes. The airplane does have to pitch down to follow the curvature of the Earth. The rate of the pitch is so slow is that it is imperceptible and absorbed completely by maintaining altitude by reference to the altimeter and vertical speed indicator. Okay, so we have at 450 KTS. It takes 40 hours to fly around the whole world. The circumnavigation, which requires the airplane to pitch down at 360 degrees. Pitching at a rate of 360 degrees every 40 hours is four times slower than the normal speed of the movement of the hour hand on a clock. You cannot see the hour hand moving at normal speed, let alone much less when it takes four times slower. It equates to one degree to pitch down every eight minutes that's flying at 450 kts. The slow rate of movement cannot be seen or felt by anyone on Earth. As far as the artificial horizon, yes, it does contain a gyroscope that remains rigid, even in space, but it also contains correcting mechanisms that can correct many degrees of error each minute. So, yes, the plane does in fact have to pitch down because of the Earth uh, well, is round. It may not seem like it, but it really is. In gravity, on the other hand, um, I've seen a lot of hearsay about gravity on this, but correct me if I'm wrong. If the Earth was flat, I'm pretty sure gravity would no longer pull anyone. Okay, here is my version of the uh, shape of the Earth. It's called oplate spheroid. Now, even though the Earth is called all plate, this is what I consider to be round, not flat, round. The Earth pretty much is oval shaped. Uh, this Earth is between the round Earth and the flat Earth, you know, right in the middle. So I consider the oval Earth to be the round Earth, or at least the correct interpretation of the round Earth. This is why we see what I call the flat earth effect. It's because of the ovalness shape of the real round earth. Um, take note, obsolete spheroid, obviously meaning sphere, and sphere, which we know, is another, another word for a circle. And we know circle is another way of saying round. And we know if the obsolete spheroid earth is round, that obviously means round Earth. You can also Google search obsolete spheroid for, for more information if you're not totally convinced. Uh, it's a bit far-fetched idea, but I believed that I may have just pulled it off. Um, I understand that this whole curvature thing may not be the strongest piece of evidence, but it does make sense. Um, 
that pretty much ends video number one. I'll catch you for video number two with more information. Uh, I hope you've learned something pretty interesting in this video. And other than that, I'll catch you, catch you up for part two. Ciao, YouTube.